Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Adriana Valenzuela. I am the Youth Leadership and Education Program Lead at the Global Center on Adaptation. And I am delighted to welcome all of you to the first GCA Learning Laboratory today on the importance of young women leadership for climate adaptation. Today, we are celebrating the International Women's Day, and it is a day to celebrate the leadership of young women and women from all over the world, but as well is an opportunity to stress the importance of gender equality. Girls and women are really affected by the impacts of climate change, but as well, they are agents of change and they can contribute to make their families and their communities more climate resilient. Today, we will start with these learning laboratories um, and. Uh, we will have a very exciting agenda. We have an agenda that brings together global experts and young people, and they, we will have the possibility to showcase concrete initiative about how young women are implementing adaptation solutions. Also, we are going to present the findings of uh, two reports and the connection between education and gender empowerment. And as well, uh, we will have the possibility to hear about the fact sheets, how we can transmit simple messages uh, targeting young people, um, also using the data that was found in the report. Then uh, to start this International Women's Day, I want to start with a video message uh, from our CEO, uh, Dr. Patrick Percogen, who uh, will address. Then uh, please, let's watch this video. Good morning, colleagues, and may I wish you all a very happy International Women's Day from here at the world's largest floating office in Rotterdam. Today, in fact, is a day to celebrate women and to remember that while climate change affects everybody, its impact on women is even greater. Climate change, as you know, can have devastating consequences for women, and that is why we are taking action and why you are taking part in this learning laboratory today. Our GCA State and Transit Adaptation Report shows that just 13% of women in Sub-Saharan Africa own land in their own name. And that is nearly three times less than their male counterparts. And the impact of this gap alone is an obstacle in the path of women to diversifying their livelihoods, and realizing their full potential. And it leaves them, women like yourself, even more exposed to climate shocks. That's just one example of how vulnerabilities increase as the global temperature rises. So what can we do to build women's resilience to these changes? In one word, education. Education is key because we as GCA, we're rolling out its youth leadership and education program across Africa, the most vulnerable continent to the climate emergency. It's early days, but so far we have trained 30 young women from six African countries as adaptation champions. They're now passing on their expertise to these communities, helping to transform them while feeding their families through adaptation projects. And I'm delighted to be able to announce that we will start a second cycle of this training program this year. Investing in gender empowerment is, as you know, is also a smart thing to do. So in collaboration with our friends at the African Development Bank, the GCA is turbocharging youth entrepreneurship. We are doing this through our Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, or AAAP, which is the world's largest adaptation program. And under this triple AP, the Youth Adapt Solutions Challenge is given women entrepreneurs the support they need to realize their potential. These entrepreneurs, these winners, receive seed funding of up to 100,000 US dollars and participation in a 12-month accelerator program. And the goal is to make them financially independent agents of change with the skills and ambition to transform 
not just their own lives, but also those of other women around them. Let me give you one example of the success of Youth Adapt. Juveline. Juveline is a talented young entrepreneur from Cameroon with the brilliant idea of using drones in real time to monitor the impact of heavy rains in her country. But Juvelin not only uses the drone data to pinpoint the drainage bottlenecks caused by garbage and trash to send her teams to harvest it and to turn it into recyclable products, but she also shares it with the city authorities so they can adapt infrastructure to the more extreme rainfall that is happening now because of climate change. In fact, it is good business because with their $100,000 Youth Adapt Award, Juvelin has been able to expand her business, opening up a second factory. And now she's on her way to quadrupling her staff. 80% of women are women from disadvantaged communities. We at GCA, we look forward to helping many more women like Juvelin to realize their goals and grow businesses that go on to support their communities. This is going to be a fantastic experience for you today in the Learning Laboratory, and we're keen to learn from you at the same time. You are going to be a source of inspiration for so many girls and young women around the world. Good luck in all you do, because with Africa's women in a leadership position, Africa is unstoppable. I thank you. Yeah. Then today we are celebrating the International uh, Women's Day with this learning laboratory about the importance of young uh, women leadership for adaptation action. Uh, I want to welcome all our speakers. We have speakers from Kenya, Nigeria, the US, China. Emirates and many other countries and to all our participants who are joined from all over the world. Now I want to invite you to join our Mentimeter. We will have two questions. Uh, you can use the Mentimeter using the code 75545434. And the question, uh, and feel free to share based on your experience, on your reality, what are these main barriers for young women when they are taking adaptation action? Then please feel free to use your mobile phone to connect also to your laptop, use the Mentimeter, also you can uh, use the, the code and share your opinion about what are these main barriers for young women uh, when they are taking adaptation action. We start to see the results, uh, economic disparities. Gender uh, violence, uh, finance, climate impacts and vulnerabilities, lack of autonomy, and it is uh, very interesting because we have multiple realities, uh, like uh, access to land. And there are multiple challenges uh, that uh, women are facing, gender discrimination, um, competing concerns, like, yes, uh, especially when uh, uh, women need to take so different roles. We also continue seeing that the financial uh, gap and uh, the opportunities for training and education. Violence. Fantastic. Then please continue. The Mentimeter will continue open and, uh, and we will continue with the second question. And uh, the second question is, what will be these main priorities? to empower women to take adaptation action. Then if we will say, okay, uh, this will be a recommendation for governments, but also other stakeholders, what are these main priorities? Then we have one of the first recommendations, sustainable finance, and uh, the Global Center on Adaptation is also supporting this area with the Youth Adapt competition that uh, brings together uh, young entrepreneurs and the 
receive funding. Uh, yes, we can see that uh, finance uh, is reiterated, um, adequate skills, education and training, participation in decision-making processes, autonomy, uh, the empowerment also of girls and uh, promoting their participation in policy-making processes. Um, the, the, the point about the rights of women, uh, also how to mainstream gender in uh, policies. Fantastic. We will continue with this Mentimeter. It is an invitation to the participants to continue engage using the code uh, 75545434. Now we will uh, move forward. We have um, different experts and uh, I am delighted to welcome Susan Shen. She is the Regional Director for Asia of the Global Center on Adaptation. Uh, thank you, Susan, to join us and uh, especially to celebrate with young women from around the world, the International Women's Day. And Susan, we have seen uh, in many opportunities uh, talking to young women, one of the key questions is, how can we build uh, our careers? And uh, they face different challenges. Then I would like to invite you. Uh, you have extensive experience, more than 30 years working at the international level, but as well, you have managed a portfolio working with the World Bank, uh, development projects. And the most important is also you have been in several um, leadership and managing positions. I would like to invite you to share your experience. How did you start? How did you get involved? And what are your recommendations, especially for young women to build their careers and their engagement in the adaptation agenda? Susan, thank you for joining us and over to you. Thank you, Adriana, and thanks everybody. I'm delighted to be here today, even though it's quite early in the morning. I mean, I'm based in Washington, DC. Um, you know, so all the questions you ask, if I just look back, right, from 30 plus years of uh, my career, actually a lot has changed. I see more women, I see more young women at the tables, uh, having discussions, uh, engaging in, uh, in different topics, right? And I also, in my, um, my previous um, position in the World Bank, I, I, I uh, recently left the World Bank to join GCA, was um, that the, you know, not only are we seeing women in uh, important decision-making leadership positions in, in organizations such as uh, the international financing institutions, but I see them everywhere. I see them in governments. I, I saw them um, in, you know, different nonprofit non organizations and so on and so forth. So that's really, you know, looking back, that's how the world has changed. But on the other hand, Things have not changed, and <laughs> we need to keep on going, and keep on, uh, you know, uh, ra raising our voices, and more important, visibility. So for me, you know, I started off um, with uh, with a much uh, technical background. So I'm glad that today's um, focus is on education. I think education is really important, right? And um, and I was very lucky. You know, I'm Chinese. I'm a Chinese American, and you know, I come from, of course, uh, the the tradition of, of a kind of a Chinese family is really go and get a good education. And I led my parents to, to immigrate actually to the US. They left everything behind in, uh, in, uh, in Taiwan and immigrated to the US so that the, my brother and I can have, you know, what they consider proper good education. And that's what we did. And I think with that education, and, you know, I'm thinking now, turning a little bit to recommendations and, uh, and uh, lessons learned, that if we want to have an influence on climate actions and climate change, I think having a fundamentals, um, some base uh, is really important. So what did I bring to the table? You know, it's younger. You know, I had a, uh, I basically had a science background. Yeah, I took a STEM education. And I think that really helped me to then link the science to the policies to operations. Um, and that takes time, you guys, so don't worry. You will you have plenty of time. And what also the, you know, my clients uh, really appreciate, I think about, about myself and about my team 
is that we bring the experience. So the second thing is not only the education as well as get, go out and get some experience, right? Because uh, a lot of our, our clients are actually have the education. You know, there's a whole, I mean, you, you guys are an example, young generation of people who are well-educated now. But then what you don't, uh, what, what the countries uh, miss is what, what they call, uh, when, when somebody told me, we want the wisdom. You know, we can buy knowledge. We can go Google it. <laughs> we can go, you know, and, and hire a consulting firm to give us the knowledge. But what you guys bring are the, uh, the wisdom that's uh, linked knowledge with experience. So something that to consider as you kind of go in your uh, up you know, in your career. So fundamentals, get a good education, get some technical background, get some experience. The second thing that I noticed, you know, was, uh, you know when I was coming, uh, you know, uh, kind of moving along in my career was that men are actually really good at networking. Women are terrible at networking. I don't know why we're just not brought up that way. <laughs> Men are very deliberate at creating a network. So in my last role, you know, I managed 40 people across the uh, uh, Asia region. I, you know, spend time encouraging women actually to create networks. You should create networks with each other, peer to peer networks. It's, you know, it's really a good support system that you can, you know, uh, learn things about what other people are doing. It's worth spending some time on that. And with regard to networks, please do speak up. Now, again, I have an Asian background. We're brought up not to speak up. <laughs> We're brought up to lessen the elders. It's a big constraint. So again, with my staff, uh, many of them with Asian background, particularly East Asian background, they will not speak up. It's just, it's almost like pulling teeth. Um, but, you know, we spend time building the network so they're more comfortable and then uh, learning to speak up because the world does want to hear from you. I mean, not, you know, you have to speak up with some uh, sharing your experience is what I encourage the, the uh, young people, but particularly the women, because women have a lot of experience that just is kind of hidden. And, I'm, and it just boggles my mind why, it, you know, it's such a, um, it's hard to get it out. Uh, and a lot of it's cultural by myself as well, you know, learning to really speak up. I, you know, if I go, I go to meetings, I don't speak up, but then when I do speak up, however, people listen, because when I do say something, I have something to say, <laughs> not just to say, uh, speak for the sake of speaking. And lastly, I think it's important to look at role models, not necessarily, I use the word mentor, but it's, it's really role models. Uh, and, and, uh, and it's something that's important. I mean, I did not re realize that when I kind of became young to middle age, I became a role model. People would come up to me and say, we have never seen a woman, you know, uh, task team leader in the World Bank. We're working on agriculture, you know, and, and doing something more technical. This is great, you know, that type of thing. So, so everything that you're doing, you are role modeling for somebody. Keep that in mind. And plus, you're, you're, you yourself are going to look for a role model of people who, I don't know, maybe in... Um, five years, it was where you want to be. And think forward, lean forward, and uh, and I think that's how you will pro progress. And lastly, you know, there's no no straight tra trajectory for for career development. I had a I had a winding road uh, road. I took a winding road because I followed my passion. Right, I started off doing natural resource management. Then I you know I went into looking at the interface with the people and the environment. I have an environment background. And then, you know, then I kind of went in zigzag, uh, went into different parts of the World Bank. The World Bank is actually, I spent most of my, my adult career there because it's such a large institution of 12,000 people. I can find different things I want to be doing and learn and, and continue to, um, to develop kind of my, my skills, right? Because I, I came in technical, but what I came, left with is, you know, a bunch of, I think skills on leadership, uh, skills on, you know, helping, you know, putting everything together. I, I always said that I'm the one to kind of integrate things. So the world is out there. And I, you know, the, today I just saw that the World Bank indicated that, uh, that you know, 53% of the workforce are women, uh, basically 43% in senior management, which I was part of before I left. And then 44% uh, now in you know, senior grade, grade level, technical, right? This is all 
very good. Although I must say that when they use these uh, this data points, I don't see the needle moving very much. It's been like that. <laughs> I would like to see it the other way, you know, more than 50% of women in management, but we're getting there. I think there are a lot of opportunities and I encourage all, you, all of you out there to, uh, you know, to seek it. It's really, it's something for you to lose. You know, it's, it's out there. So thank you very much, Adriana. Thank you very much, Susan, for these reflections and uh, for all the participants that are joining us from all over the world. We have people that join from the Dominican Republic, uh, from the Middle East, from uh, Asia. Then some of the takeaways and recommendations from Susan. First of all, prepare yourself, invest in your education and develop your skills, including your leadership skills. Second, build your network. Third, uh, and learn how to speak up, uh, look at um, role models. And the most important is also to connect, to connect science with policy and operations and to integrate. Then we continue celebrating this International Women's Day with our next speaker. I am delighted to welcome Emily Wolf. She is the team lead of the education policy and partnerships. And, um, and, uh, and she uh, also has contributed to one of the latest uh, reports uh, that the Commonwealth and Development Office of the United Kingdom just released last year. We are delighted uh, to welcome you, Emily. Thank you for uh, your participation. Uh, the United Kingdom hosted COP26 in 2021 and had been one of the countries really uh, moving forward the climate change agenda, but as well this connection between education and girls' education. Uh, I would like to invite you, uh, Emily, to share with us the key findings of this report addressing the climate, environment, and biodiversity crisis through uh, girls' education. Over to you, Emily. Thank you so much, Adriana. And also, um, just to say, it's very I'm very honoured to be invited to speak uh, to um, the colleagues online, the participants online about this, uh, this topic, uh, particularly on International Women's Day. Um, today, the UK has also published um, a women and girls strategy, which I hope my colleague will provide the link to in the chat. And you can see that um, our focus on women and girls continues uh, as, a, as a major priority for the UK government. So it's a very exciting day for us uh, today. Um, but here I'm going to talk a little bit about our position paper that um, we developed last year. Uh, my colleague Camilla Pankhurst, who is one of the policy leads in my team, developed this policy paper. Um, and so I'm speaking on her behalf. She's now on maternity leave. Um, but uh, She worked with some of you, I think, very closely in developing this position paper. The important thing to say, I think, to those online is that, um, you know, I've been working in education for 20 plus years in international development and all of the contexts in which I've been working in supporting young women, supporting uh, boys and girls, uh, disadvantaged children to get access to education. All of the contexts I've worked in have also been, uh, you know, work, address it, having to address the, the impacts of the climate and environment crisis. So this isn't a new thing, but actually uh, what we realised is that in uh, the FCDO, in the UK uh, department, where we lead on our overseas development work, we didn't have any anything written down about our priorities and our positions, and we hadn't looked at this in enough detail. So this paper was an attempt to, to really put down, you know, our thoughts on what we thought needed to be happen, um, a call to action really to try and bring together other partners that were interested in this and try and make the case for even more focus, even more bringing together of these, uh, these challenging issues of sort of the crisis in education, but also the crisis in, in terms of envir the environmental change and, and climate change that many communities were facing. So just to quickly run through the paper, um, so uh, you'll have seen, I think in the, um, let me just check whether you are, uh, I don't think you have the slides, but I am going to just not use the slides. I'm just going to run you through the slides because I think that's a nicer way of dealing with it. Um, so we know that, you know, uh, the, the climate crisis affecting many different communities. If we look at, say, for example, uh, Pakistan and the floods in Pakistan uh, in uh, the last year, we have a huge number of people affected by the, sl the floods, 33 million people affected, 3.5 million children affected um, with, um, you know, 25 uh, 
thousand schools damaged or destroyed um, and then other schools now having to be uh, used sort of in a, in a temporary way to, to, to house displaced populations. So you can see the ex an example, a very potent example of how climate change um, is really impacting the education sector and continues to impact the education sector around the world. And we know that in those kind of contexts, often the most vulnerable children are impacted um, and girls in particular uh, face huge challenges. A massive amount of money is needed to respond to that, but we also need to really think thoughtfully about how we rebuild education systems in context where the climate crisis um, is, is, is really at the forefront. So um, the policy paper sets out a case for action. What are the different reasons why we think we need to bring uh, education and climate together? How can we, um, so the imperative is, is kind of two, there are two elements to it. How can we safeguard education, particularly girls' education, from the impacts of climate and environmental change? And then how can we also maximize the impact of education in addressing uh, climate resilience and adaptation and mitigation with those communities uh, and with those school leaders? We know that the relationship between uh, climate and education is very complicated. It's happening, you know, it's impacts at systems level, school level, household community level and individual level. And so we, the paper, which I invite you to have a look at, just try to map out all the different elements of that relationship and looks at, you know, the positive aspects of how we can mitigate, how we can, how we can adapt systems, but also the negative aspects, how the crisis uh, of the climate crisis is impacting and disrupting education. It also tries to, the paper tries to set out uh, a new framework for change. What are the ways in which we can adapt the way we are operating in education and the way we are responding to try to address this crisis? So the framework for our action is really about thinking more thoughtfully about how we respond and how we um, how we seek to deliver. For the FCDO in particular, we've tried to identify some areas of action for ourselves. Um, the first one is around finance, um, and we've sort of set ourselves some objectives and some things that we think need to be done around financing. So we want to try to bring together uh, the climate and environment co-benefits into our existing and new education programming. So that can be quite complicated, but ultimately what we're saying is if we bring this month, the, the way we finance climate and education together, we can see mutual benefits between uh, those two types of interventions. We also want to try and advocate for more money uh, to be spent on education from uh, climate finance. And obviously there's some very technical aspects uh, that we have to address in being able to do that. But we're saying that there's a, you know, there's a huge commitment, there's a growing commitment to, to respond to the climate crisis. And we know that education as a sector is something that we need to do more, we do need to do more on, in particular uh, for girls and women. Um, on the second, the second area is around uh, sort of like our capability and our, our skills. Um, and we've called that sort of people. Uh, and maybe that speaks a little bit to the to the, the discussion today. You know, what is our responsibility as individuals engaged and interested in education? What do we need to do to upskill ourselves and to prepare ourselves to be active agents of change in this space? So we've made some commitments there around what we're going to do as FCDO to really build our capability, our technical capability um, as education specialists and as education specialists advising government and working with other partners around the world. Um, but we also want to find ways in which we can um, make sure that this is sustained over time and that governments are committing to do that for themselves. So one of the things that we're interested to see a little bit in follow on from our COP26 work is um, that at subsequent COPs, education is more purposefully uh, integrated into the plans of countries to respond to the climate crisis. So as part of their um, nationally determined contributions and also their action plans, how are they really integrating education uh, into, their, into their work? And then the third area that we're really prioritizing is, is around partnership. Um, and that speaks a little bit to our collaboration with GCA. You know, 
where are the other really proactive partners around the world who are interested in this topic and how can we work more closely together and convene and bring our energies together uh, to sort of form a, a kind of coalition of the willing on climate and education who are the allies who are the partners who can help us to really drive some of this delivery uh, at the country level but also at important um, you know moments of the year say for example through the UN FCC processes and the cops that we have so it's being able to bring the challenges uh, to light at those kind of moments that we think will be really uh, important and valuable um, but I, I know this is quite a um, this is quite a uh, a policy this is very much a policy paper for colleagues which is a bit different as an intervention in this in the in this um in this discussion but i wanted to um just say that this is ultimately a paper that's really targeting governments um, and other partners, multilateral partners, bilateral partners, NGOs on this issue around bringing together climate and education. Um, but it is also recognising that there is a growing but also still limited evidence base about how we do this well. So it's also trying to bring focus to the challenge of building the evidence base, um, but also sort of raising that kind of call to action amongst our partners and trying to spur others on as well as ourselves uh, to do more. Um, and I realise that I've probably gone over my five minutes. So I apologise for that, Adriana, but I hope that's given some some. Uh, insights into what the UK government is thinking on uh, education and particularly girls' education and climate. Thanks a lot, Emily. And I think that there are also some key recommendations uh, that you outline in this uh, policy paper. One, the need for finance, uh, also the skills development. How important is continuing integrating uh, education as part of the climate change policies and programs? And the most important is alone, we cannot move forward this agenda we need to establish partnership. And it is an excellent transition, Emily, as well, to our next speaker. We have uh, as well, Christina, Christina Quack. She's a, a global expert who has been working on the topic of uh, climate change and uh, education for several years. Uh, very glad to see you here, Christina. And uh, every year, the Global Center on Adaptation is preparing a report, a report that brings the latest information and data related to adaptation. We have prepared the stakes report and um, last year one of the chapters had been dedicated to education with very concrete findings about what is happening in Africa and how we can connect then the topic about education but also how education can be a driver for accelerating adaptation solutions. Then Christina over to you. Uh, please share with us some of these key findings and recommendations. Great, thank you so much for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be able to talk about the chapter in the report. It was certainly a highlight of last year for me. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, Emily has already spoken a lot about the nexus of education and climate change, especially as it can, pertains to girls and women. But I think what, what perhaps I can help pr uh, provide a little further context to is really understanding how, when we think about the education and climate nexus, you know, it goes in two ways, right? First, there is the negative impact that climate change has on education systems, and this can happen in both direct and indirect ways. So when we look at that, we can see that you know, cl extreme climate events can have physical infrastructural damage on school systems, um, can damage our schools, rip off roofs, um, uh, destroy the existing and strained uh, water and sanitation infrastructure that supports schools and so on, right? So there can be the direct impact on the physical places that we learn and teach. Um, the direct impacts can also be felt by the humans, the people in the education system. So whether that means the teachers and the educators or the students themselves and their families, um, we have to think about the people as well in that in those systems. We can think about it too from the perspective of um, school processes, you know, the actual delivery of education or through the curriculum, whether the curriculum is even relevant in the context of climate crisis and that sort of thing. Um, so we think about the direct effects and we think about the stress that, that, that climate change can have on school systems. And then we also think about the indirect effects. So how climate change can impact 
um, in climate vulnerable countries that are dependent on climate sensitive industries like agriculture, um, things that can ripple down into households and to that that then have an extreme effect on girls and women, especially. So things like, for example, if an agricultural system is affected by drought, then households that are dependent on those agricultural yields um, will experience economic economic shock that then triggers um, uh, gender unequal thinking and practices that could potentially disrupt schooling and especially for girls by withdrawing girls, for example. We know that when girls are withdrawn from school, this places that them at an increased risk of not only um, early enforced child marriage, but an early premature start to adulthood. So we know that um, unplanned or unwanted pregnancies begin and, and um, even the engagement in transactional sex in order to secure basic needs like food and even school supplies, shelter, and so on. All of these things start to get triggered um, by something from, you know, that seems to be completely unrelated in, in terms of effect on agriculture, right? Um, we have to also understand that uh, existing, um, uh, you know, Existing strains caused by gender unequal systems, gender inequality just simply exacerbates all of the direct and indirect effects that climate change has on education systems. So when we think about gender norms and how um, uh, gender roles in households where um, girls and women have to take care of domestic household responsibilities and, and secure um, domestic household resources like water and fuel, um, fire, uh, firewood, and so on. These kinds of things have a direct implication to their connection to the natural environment. So in times of drought, um, those household responsibilities mean that girls and women have to spend longer time securing those resources. And for girls, this means having to, you know, that time takes into their time to study. It takes time away from their ability to go to school, or it means they arrive at school too tired to learn. And therefore, um, their learning outcomes diminish. And in places where sending girls to school are already is already a, um, you know, done with some resistance, this places the increased, you know, it, this creates increased questions around whether girls should go to school if they're not doing well in school, right? So we know that climate change has a significant amount of direct effects and indirect effects on the education systems through all these different vectors. So whether that's the physical infrastructure or human, the humans and the people in those systems, um, through their processes, through their content. And we also know that things like gender inequality just exacerbates what those impacts can have. Um, we know that, you know, estimates su suggest that, it, you know, 22 out of the 33 countries where children bear the greatest uh, uh, vulnerabilities to climate change are in Africa. So we know that these, these um, risks are very, very real for children and especially girls in, in, in the African context. But on the flip side, we also know that an investment in climate adapted, climate resilient education systems is vital to increasing the adaptive capacity and the climate resilience of households and communities and individuals. And this impact is especially felt among girls and, and women. Um, we see through the analysis that we've done for this chapter that more education is correlated with strength and adaptive capacity and reduced climate vulnerability. And this relationship is even stronger for girls and women. So this reinforces the urgent need to ensure that girls have access to 12 years of quality, empowering education. And this again is especially the case for the 22 African countries where girls' education ex is expected to be disrupted by the effects of climate change impacts the most. So we see that you know not only is education important for building climate literacy, uh, for building uh, skills and green skills, but this has especially especially amplified impacts and effects if we do this with a special focus on girls and women. So we know with climate literacy, climate literacy and the building of a breadth of green skills is important for building um, not only knowledge about climate change and its potential impacts, allowing for girls and their and their households and their communities to better plan for and cope. Uh, cope with uh, climate disruptions and climate shocks. Um, but we also know that building those green skills is vital to their inc inclusion and their participation in green jobs. 
in green and sustainable livelihoods. And that this means that as countries transition to more renewable energy, to lower carbon economies, to a green economy, this means that we can center girls and women in this new alternative economy and no longer see them at the fringes of, of what today is our fossil fuel driven economy, right? Um, so we understand that building climate literacy is sort of the foundational stepping stones to building these broader green skills that are vital to their, their economic inclusion in a green economy. And we also know that those skills are vital to decision making and leadership and their participation in those um, important uh, leadership and decision making bodies. And research has, there's plenty of research to show that this has so many pro environmental impacts, not only in terms of the types of climate policies, the, 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 the boldness of those climate policies at a country level, but also the climate footprints, the carbon footprints of their countries. So we know that there are, you know, not only you know, far reaching ripple effects when it comes to the impact of climate change on education systems, but there's also far reaching positive ripple effects when it comes to ensuring that girls and women uh, are, have, uh, you know, 12 years of quality empowering education that builds climate literacy and builds a breadth of green skills. So, you know, the evidence is there. We just need to be, you know, we need to take action uh, to, to see that come to fruition around the world. So thank you, Adriana, for some time to talk about the chapter. Um, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Christina. And as you said, there is a, this very close interconnection about investing and making possible that all girls and young women can access to quality education and also building this climate literacy and uh, the connection between green skills and uh, economic inclusion. And it is a perfect transition because one of the challenges that we have found is how young women have opportunities to develop their business ideas and how they can have this uh, economic inclusion. Now, I want to bring now uh, two change makers. We are going to move forward from the findings of this report that highlight the importance of financing, education, investing in uh, young women to uh, stories of change. We have two uh, young uh, women that they are change makers. Uh, I am welcome. I am delighted to welcome Balike Saluden. She is one of the members of the GCA Youth Advisory Panel and she is from Nigeria. And also Mariana Chiganga, she's one of the winners of the Youth Adapt 2022, a competition that the Global Center on Adaptation organized annually, providing um, training, coaching, but the most important is funding to entrepreneurs in Africa and especially uh, young women. Then both of you, Balikers and, um, and Marianne, both of you are agents of change. We are talking about here about young women leadership and you are um, uh, a case to celebrate to recognize and what i would like is that you share your experience both of you are implementing concrete projects and solutions addressing the impacts of climate change in your countries in nigeria and kenya then i would like to invite uh, to share your story how you started and what project are you implementing and what solutions it is bringing for the adaptation agenda then balikers over to you Thank you so much, Andriana, and um, hello, everyone. I'm super delighted um, to be here, and thank you so much, Jessia, for the opportunity. Um, I, I would like to reflect first on how the BKMC in partnership with GCA, the uh, Young, Young Women Leadership in Adaptation Program, has actually helped me uh, understand you know, adaptation much better and also understand the importance of collaboration. Um, I, I personally feel like collaboration is key, especially when we want to go far in combating climate crisis everywhere around the world. Um, the program was a very lengthy one. And um, when I applied for it, I knew that I was going to commit my time to it because it was super time consuming. At the same time, it was resource driven. We had experts from all over the world who come in at interval, and we had a lot of resources. Um, on the website that we use for, for learning and um, upskilling different classes, different courses, different assignments. Um, at the end of the program, we were expected to come up with a 
micro adaptation project. And uh, before I joined the program, I already had the Shilis Climate Action um, project that I'm working on here in Nigeria, but I've not put so much work into bringing it into reality. After the, I was able to submit that for my micro adaptation project and um, so strongly highlighted and welcomed. Um, currently, I'm delighted to share that the Shilis Climate Action is now embarking on a fellowship program which is um, how I see the importance of stepping down the knowledge that I have acquired. And I've also understand the fact that many people do not understand uh, what climate change is, how they can uh, you know, better understand how they can take sustainable action. So the fellowship we're launching in the second quarter of this year, we have already mapped out partners um, funding for it and uh, the idea behind the fellowship is basically to connect young women in Nigeria to key climate related organizations that they would work with for a period of four months and the last two months of the fellowship the fellowship is going to be six months and the last two months of the fellowship is going to be uh, a funded period where we're going to be funding them with 200,000 naira to carry out a mini project in their community with the organizations they've been able to connect with. Why are we doing this? The reason why we're doing this is because personally from experience, when I started my climate um, activism journey, I have little to no support. I had little to no direction. I was basically doing things myself. I'm a, I'm a graduate of communications. I never imagined myself in this space. And I took it upon myself to take online courses with Cornell universities and many, many other platforms. But I realized that many young men might not have opportunity for this. And that is why we're connecting them with organizations that would help them upskill, help them understand organizational skill when it comes to climate change, help them understand critical things that they need to identify before they find solutions towards a particular um, climate action. So these are the things that we're currently doing with the um, Shilits Climate Action um, Fellowship Program. And uh, we are hoping that, I mean, this is going to be like a yearly thing and it's going to be for six months. We're looking at 12 young people uh, at every point in time. And and for for my work at Guru Public Farms, I'm a farmer and um, I we, we ensure that we inculcate inclusiveness in our practices because we do not want to have a company where uh, it's gender bias, um, there is a gender barrier that women cannot do this, women cannot do that. So we have a strong old and we have a, a an initiative where we house our women, which is the Green Women Initiative, where we support women in our community to also farm with us, to work with us, to learn from us good practices um, when it comes to climate change. So it's not like uh, we're doing it alone. It's not like we're farming alone. It's not like uh, we're, we're, we're just working. We're working in an inclusive manner with communities, with women, and helping them understand best practices because most of these women are also farmers but they are very, very small older farmers. Some of them don't even have their farmlands again due to one um, gender or family issues or the other. But we've been able to give them that room, farm, work with us and learn um, from part of our practices. So those, these are ways that I am currently taking and leading action um, when it comes to adaptation, when it comes to climate action um, in Nigeria. And aside from that, um, as Andrana rightfully introduced me, I'm a 2023 GCA Youth Advisory Panel where we work with the CEO on ensuring, you know, um, more inclusiveness of young people in the GCA process and, and, and action. So, yeah, thank you so much, Andrana, and over to you. Thanks a lot, Valkes. And uh, you highlight collaboration, the importance of connecting institutions and young women, uh, identifying good practices and uh, helping young women to work in their communities. And Marianne, now is the opportunity for you. It was a, the Jutatap is an annual competition. You have been one of the winners, thousands of applications from all over Africa, a small uh, and medium entrepreneurs apply to have the support. Then uh, first of all, congratulations. And we are really happy to have you here. Please share with us uh, your business idea and what are you doing to really address the challenge of uh, climate change, especially to bring adaptation solutions. Over to you, Marianne. 
Okay, thank you so much, Adriana. My name is Miriam Gishanga, the CEO and co-founder of AgriTech Analytics. It's a company in Africa where we leverage on uh, satellite imagery data, AI, and IoT sensors to conduct soil health analysis and predict crop pests and diseases for smallholder farmers. So we are working with, currently we are working with 3,000 smallholder farmers in my country in three counties. Now what we do with these farmers is that we give them a handheld device where they map it, where, where they just uh, plant it into their farm and we map their farm into a system. So we get data from two sources. That is the IoT device in the farm and the satellite imagery data that we get. So we compare the two details and we give the farmer um, details that are going to help them with their farm. So on their phone, the farmer is able to get the crop pests and diseases that are affecting their crop early enough so that they're able to come back them before they destroy the crop. We're also able to give them the soil health analysis so the farmer knows the kind of inputs to use so in a way, we are saving on the amount of money that they spend. We also help this farmer um, leave the traditional farming methods and embrace smart agriculture. So in this climate change generation where soil degradation has become too much and climate change has just affected everything, we are able to help this farmer understand how they are going to run their farm with precise details of what they are going to use so that they, they, they they still are able to go ahead with climate change. We also have another amazing feature. Options can be used as collateral for loans. And I'm happy to tell you that 98 farmers have already benefited from this, where they use the yield predictions, give to the banks and financial institutions, and they've been able to acquire loans. And the loans are used to buy seed and fertilizer. So at the end of the day, the farmer is able to work. Even without money, they're able to work with a collateral of a yield prediction. So now we are working with over 75% of the population we are working with are women. And you know, when a woman is affected, the whole family is affected. So we are happy to say that we are supporting uh, uh, education for the girl child because when we enable the mother to continually get their produce and make, uh, they, they, we, we empower them economically, then they are able to still maintain their girls and their other children in school. So. Um, we have been privileged to be awarded winners of the 2022 Youth Adaptation Challenge, where they awarded us with $100,000. This amount will be very useful to us. It will help us to um, spread our wings. Currently, as I said, we have 3,000 farmers and we are looking to have 15,000 farmers by the end of 2024. Um, these will be expanded to five more counties in the United country, as you're aware, drought and hunger has really affected um, most parts of Africa. And in my country, particularly in Kenya, we have 32 counties relying on government food aid. So with our solution, we are able to help the smallholder farmers still be able to produce food. We are fighting hunger, we are fighting poverty. So at the end of the day, we will well, our main agenda is to end hunger in Africa. So hopefully by the year 2026, we'll be able to expand to other countries in Africa. And thank you so much to the to DCA and the Triple AP program for giving us the financial muscle to be able to expand and to be able to in our hearts now expand to other farmers yes thank you marianne and as you said when I, yeah thank you for sharing your uh, your project and uh, we are very glad to know that Brianna, can you hear me Yes, Marianne, we can hear you. And, and thank you very much for sharing the experience. You said when a um, woman is affected, the whole family is affected. And I think that we can also turn all this into when a woman is empowered, the whole family and also the community can be empowered because women play a very important role as a multipliers. Um, now we will continue. And now we want to also hear from you, especially from our participants. We have excellent um, intervention from experts sharing their experience, sharing the 
key findings of reports. Uh, now we have a general overview about two concrete stories in Africa about how women are leading transformation and are also implementing adaptation solutions. But now we want to hear from you. What we are going to do is we uh, are going to break uh, in two groups. Group one that will be facilitated by uh, IFA and group two that will be facilitated by Nicolo. Both of them are um, team members of the Youth Leadership Program. And we will discuss in their son minutes what are these challenges, but as well the opportunities for uh, fostering young women uh, action and participation in the adaptation agenda. Then uh, now over to Nicolo and uh, IFA. Mm -hmm that they will help us uh, to divide in working groups. Right. All right, then uh, thanks for waiting and uh, welcome everyone to this breakout group session. Uh, we will now uh, be waiting for everyone to move uh, to the other breakout group, which will be, uh, I can see Ifa now, wonderful. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, my name is Nicola Del Porto. Uh, I'm working uh, in the Youth Leadership Education team uh, here in the floating office in Rotterdam. And, uh, now, okay, so we are just finishing to fix the uh, breakout groups. Um, in the meanwhile, um, I can introduce you the question for today's short breakout group session. Uh, we will be working on defining uh, the challenges and the opportunities of the inclusion of uh, young women in adaptation uh, planning, uh, in adaptation action. So um, I'm very curious to hear uh, your opinions, your ideas and thoughts, especially uh, after uh, today's discussion. We've been hearing lots of speakers, lots of experts uh, in the field of adaptation, young leaders, and also success stories from Africa. Uh, I think there, are, there has been lots of content uh, for, uh, for us to elaborate on. Uh, so maybe uh, we can start by yeah, people will uh, introduce that they, when they will share their opinion, mm -hmm. then that they already can mention the name and the content. Like if we Wonderful. know who will be there, and then some challenges that they have found and uh, opportunities. Wonderful. Then, uh, then as you as you have heard, maybe we can start with a short round of introductions. And already they, they, they say where they are from, but also the challenge and the opportunity already. Oh, wonderful. Then maybe we can start by order of people that I can see in the uh, waiting in the in the in the participants list. I see I see uh Kathy, which will also shortly speak. Uh Kat, if you want to introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, and maybe if you want to share with us uh, one challenge and one opportunity uh, related to the inclusion of young women in uh, adaptation actions. 
Thanks, Nicolo. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm Kathy, part of um, the outgoing GCA Youth Advisory Panel of the CEO and dialing in um, from the snowy London today, surprisingly. Um, but great to see everyone. And um, I think from my end, a challenge would be young, per young people's engagement in multilateral processes and how we advocate for stronger multilateral policy on adaptation and how that um, how that influence national policy making and then all the way down to local level. So I think it's really important to make sure that young people are being empowered and being represented in their voices and concerns are being shared in all these levels. Um, so I think obviously a lot of efforts are required and it's great um, that GCA has put in so much efforts in the past um, years. And I guess which leads us to an opportunity is um, I'm sure Ife or Nicola will share the link to the Youth Adaptation Network, which um, the, our amazing youth leadership team will send regular opportunities and updates on our activities and ways to get involved um, for us to also highlight your, your voices um, in opportunities we have. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kati. And uh, thanks for raising a very important challenge in the inclusion of young women in adaptation action, which is uh, the access to decision policy making. Uh, this is urgent and probably some other people will share the same views. So describing it as uh, one of the major challenges in adaptation action. I will move now forward and I will ask maybe uh, Daphne, Daphne Avino, if you want to introduce yourself, tell us where you're from and uh, just tell us your thoughts on one challenge and one opportunity of the inclusion of young women in adaptation action. Or just your thoughts on the topic, of course. Um, Daphne, can you can you hear me? Um, all right, maybe maybe I will give you the floor uh, later after maybe Hussein Hussein Ali. Um, if you want to uh, share your uh, uh, the country of origin, uh, where you're from, and uh, one opportunity, one challenge uh, for uh, the inclusion of young women in uh, adaptation actions, in adaptation policies. Uh, maybe we can also discuss about uh, which are uh, some of the barriers uh, to the access of women, young women, particularly in decision-making spaces, uh, which is one of the challenges that Cathy just mentioned. Um, just your thoughts on uh, what do you think should be done for uh, uh, mainstreaming uh, uh, young women's participation in these processes? Uh, if anyone wants to uh, share their views on this, maybe uh, I can ask um, Mr. Hassan um, if you if you can hear me. Mm, maybe Mutiat uh, Dozumu. Well, for sure, for sure, the access to decision making processes at all levels is something uh, uh, urgent to be implemented in terms of um, the access, uh, facilitating the access of uh, young women. Um, as we've seen from today's presentation, uh, there are so many uh, barriers to uh, such inclusion, uh, but at the same time, uh, we have also seen some success stories. Uh, we've been talking about uh, Balikes and Marianne stories. Uh, Benedicta? I can see, yes, sorry, Benedicta, I haven't seen you uh, in, the, in the list. Hello. Hi, Benedicta. My name is Benedicta. I'm from Indonesia. So the opportunities and the challenges that I've been facing so far in regards to climate adaptation has been the challenge to find adaptation education. So it's like um, we are still lacking courses and ed trainings that are directed towards climate adaptation. If we have that, we can actually we can actually 
create visions and missions that are related to climate adaptation as a leader. Mm -hmm. I think that's all that I can share right now. And uh, can you maybe think about uh, one opportunity? Uh, let's say there were, let's say there is more uh, adaptation education and uh, more young women have access uh, to some uh, spaces uh, in which at the moment they are hindered, they cannot access. What do you think would be one of the uh, most relevant opportunity of the inclusion of young women like you and others? I can think of some kind of opportunity, business acceleration program. So it is. it will be a program where young women are gathered and men in regards to climate and climate adaptation so that they can build their own business that can solve problems that we have in regards to climate education and also climate action. Brilliant, Benedicta. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Thanks. I see uh, maybe Daphne, uh, now you want to share your thoughts, uh, your ideas on some challenges, some opportunities of including um, young women in adaptation action. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Oh, hi, my name is Daphne. I'm from Kenya. Um, the major challenge that I have experienced so far is to do with our curriculum. And basically there's so much being done um, to teach us on what is climate change and what climate change um, impacts are but there's, uh, there's, uh, it's not enough, it's not sufficient. Our curriculum needs to be boosted or changed in order to have a greater impact with regards to the current climate crisis that we're facing. So that is my challenge and uh, an opportunity. Um, like for instance, right now, I mean, I'm developing an, a good, uh, I'm sorry, I'm developing an, a paper on natural capital. So I really see it as a good opportunity to boost our revenue streams. And the same aspect wasn't really in our curriculum back then when I was in school. So I see that as a big opportunity to be able to achieve sustainability. Thank you, that's all. Brilliant, Daphne. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your views and your thoughts. And uh, it's also very interesting to hear that you're working on uh, publication. Uh, maybe I can, I can further ask you something, as I can see that uh, there are so many people uh, which are expressing the uh, challenge of education uh, as one of the most impelling ones. So maybe if you want to share with uh, the rest of the group, uh, if you had any uh, difficulty or if you can feel any difficulty inside the uh, education sector, uh, I don't know if you are now wrote, writing your uh, publish um, your publication uh, at the university level or if it's some individual job, but in general, you. what's your, perspe your perspective on uh, uh, the ability of accessing education for young women in your country or in your experience? Um, the ability, okay, access is there. The access is, is, is really available. There's no problem with accessing education. The, my problem, uh, uh, the problem could be, I'm, visual, I'm seeing a problem of the quality of the education that is in, invested in us is the problem. The, we are past, uh, we are still focusing on mitigation yet we are past. Uh, I believe we are past mitigation. We should be able to now focus on adaptation as much to be able to achieve, to be able to create um, the yeah, to be able to create uh, the young ones to come up with better mechanisms and and uh, you know just uh, basically that's that's the problem that I have. But the access is there. Yes, I understand that. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, your contribution. And uh, as has been noted, I will uh, try to leave the floor now to Felix Nyabeni. Uh, I see you just joined the breakout group. So if you want to maybe share your uh, country of origin and uh, any uh, challenge or opportunities that come up to your mind when thinking about the uh, access uh, to uh, 
um, uh, decision-making processes or in general, uh, the inclusion of young women in uh, uh, adaptation action. If you can hear me, Felix, or maybe Mukiat, Hassan, can you hear me? You want to share your thoughts? What we can see from the discussion so far is that we have uh, two big challenges, two shared challenges. Uh, one is indeed uh, the action, the access to uh, policy making and uh, implementation of policies. So considering young women at all stages of uh, decision making. Uh, the other one is adaptation education, uh, which is a topic that has been uh, discussed uh, during the presentation today, during the discussion by the experts and uh, some other young women leaders. Um, indeed, adaptation education is something that uh, must be tackled, uh, especially in light of the many opportunities that we have uh, in terms of indeed facilitating uh, the inclusion of young women in, uh, in these uh, in spaces, in the education space, uh, of course, but uh, also in the policy making level, uh, at the national and the international level, uh, this can have uh, very powerful repercussions uh, on uh, our society, uh, on our economy, on the way we live. Um, if you... Hello, Nicola, are you hearing me? Yes, we can hear you, son. Okay, uh, uh, my name is Hassan I'm from Bangladesh. Welcome. Actually, I want to share uh, my some experience because uh, you know that Bangladesh is one of the most climate affected countries, especially in the coastal area, are becoming phenomenal and uh, irreversible. Uh, actually, uh, low lying areas and uh, integrated coastal infrastructure production are the major problem. Uh, and you know that lack of adaptation capacity, the affected communities, especially coastal community, are affected are, and they are unable to prevent uh, their loss of income due to natural, various natural calamities, as like as cyclone, water logging. But the major problem is there, economic incapability pushes women and girls, especially adolescents, to gender-based violence and neglects their rights. Uh, that's why a large number of adolescents in that area, uh, they are uh, dropping out of the school and trapped in early marriage and victims of social uh, repression and gender-based violence. Uh, this is actually our uh, to experience. So uh, I think this is very important to strengthen and uh, information because you know that uh, information is the uh, power and uh, this is very important to facilitate uh, their information or education. Uh, to strengthen their uh, resilience capacity, especially climate adaptation capacity for building their economic resilience. Uh, I think this is very important uh, to lead a better livelihood for their. Uh, thank you, Anikulam. Thanks a lot, Hassan. And thanks for sharing your, your experience, the experience of other people uh, that you've been uh, being in contact with. Uh, yes, sharing sharing uh, concrete stories, practical stories, uh, is probably one of the most effective ways to communicate uh, climate. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, it would be it would be uh, beautiful not to have uh, bad stories to tell. But unfortunately, there are lots of uh, challenges and uh, uh, hindrances uh, that people face as a consequence of climate change. And uh, it is worth mentioning these stories. Um, I see Zainab is joining and soon the rest of the uh, plenary uh, will be gathered again and we will uh, move forward to the next session, um, the final session. So uh, Felix, um, sorry Zainab, uh, I see you just joined, uh, welcome. Um, we are just discussing about uh, some challenges and some uh, 
uh, opportunities of the inclusion of young women uh, in adaptation action, uh, in, adapt in adaptation policy making. And, uh, and now the breakout groups will close. Uh, people are starting to, to come back. So thanks for this very fruitful discussion. I will give the floor back to you, Adriana. Welcome everyone. Now, thank you everyone. Welcome uh, back to the plenary room. We have working groups discussing what are some of the challenges, but as well opportunities regarding uh, young women empowerment and participation in not only decision-making processes, but as well in adaptation action. Then we have two working groups. Uh, uh, what I would like to do is to invite very briefly to our two facilitators in this case, uh, Nicolo and Ifa, to share very briefly some of the key points discussed in the working groups. What are, what are, for instance, some of the challenges that you have identified, but also what are some of the opportunities? Then, uh, Nicolo, over to you. What are these challenges? Thanks a lot, Adriana. I hope you can hear me. Um... No, it's okay. So yes, uh, in uh, in our group, uh, we discussed about some challenges and opportunities of the inclusion of young women in uh, adaptation action, in uh, adaptation decision making spaces, and uh, also in uh, education. In fact, uh, the challenge that has been evidenced by the majority of participants is indeed the challenge of adaptation education. Uh, so it's not about accessing uh, education itself. Uh, access has been uh, uh, perceived uh, as something that is uh, easily uh, achievable. Uh, the problem is more about the curriculums. So about the knowledge that is being shared with uh, uh, young people, including, of course, uh, young women and uh, uh, the poor quality of environmental education and climate literacy as well, as Christina was mentioning before during her intervention, is probably uh, something that really creates a barrier for uh, young women in taking adaptation action. Uh, another point that has been raised is uh, the access uh, to policy making and decision making spaces for young women at all levels, at the national, at the regional, at the international level. Uh, of course, uh, this is uh, something that has uh, terrible repercussions because the voices of a large portion of people uh, are being cut. Uh, but we also discussed some opportunities, uh, so uh, including young women as part of business acceleration programs uh, can definitely be something that uh, gives uh, lots of um, uh, abilities, new skills to knowledge to these young women and also creates economic opportunities for them and uh, uh, the inclusion in uh, uh, academic spaces. Uh, to foster um, discussions among uh, uh, young women, people in general, and especially, uh, it has been mentioned, the Youth Adaptation Network, uh, which is the network uh, that some of you are part of, uh, that we invite you to join. Uh, we will share the links at the end, and it's the space where we share lots of opportunities related to adaptation uh, with uh, our uh, young leaders uh, audience. Thanks, Adriana. Excellent. Then, Ifa, over to you. Very brief, because we, we need to continue with the agenda that we have. What are some of these challenges and opportunities that were discussed at the group? Thank you, Thank you Adriana. Um, so there were three challenges that were uh, highlighted. Uh, one is that women face competing concerns when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to um, uh, extreme weather events such as floods and droughts. Um, secondly, there are safety concerns when taking uh, when taking certain uh, adaptation interventions. Um, women are impacted differently because they also have safety concerns to think about. And thirdly, male discourses and gender bias continue to sort of prevent women from engaging in uh, adaptation action. And one of the main solutions we had far too little time, but one of the main solutions that was that presented is that more awareness and education uh, will help uh, to uh, combat these um, these challenges. Back to you, Adriana. Thanks a lot. And it has been highlighted that how young 
uh, not only women, but uh, young people can access to data and information. And I am also very glad to announce that the Global Center on Adaptation today is launching the uh, Youth Fact Sheet. Basically, uh, technical information and findings of the report will be uh, uh, summarized, and it has been summarized by members of the Youth Advisory Panel. And today we will share with you a draft of the fact sheet on gender that has been produced jointly by Bali Cares, Kathy Shema, three members of the Youth Advisory Panel, uh, ladies from China, the United Emirates and also Nigeria working together. Then very brief, uh, Cathy, if you can share with us about what is this um, fact sheet and very brief also some of the key findings, uh, please, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Adriana. Um, and hi everyone, happy International Women's Day. Um, to briefly- We cannot my... hear you, Cathy. I hope this is helpful. Is it working now? I hope I'm audible now. Kathy, okay. let's try yeah. again. Yeah, I hope I'm audible. Excellent. Okay, perfect. Um, great. So just want to say happy International Women's Day to everyone. Um, and I'm joining in my capacity as now GCA's Regional Youth Coordinator for Asia, um, but also as outgoing youth advisor to our CEO, Patrick, um, and really enjoyed hearing from all the previous speakers. Um, so thanks, everyone. And to briefly introduce myself, I have been following UNFCCC processes since I was um, a teenager focusing on youth empowerment and gender mainstreaming. So really great to see such a session being put together um, by our amazing youth team. So for the next few minutes, I'll share with you something um, that I'm really excited about, which is the launch of our gender fact sheet as the first fact sheet of our series that we as GCA's CEO Youth Advisory Panel are working on, um, of course, with the support from other colleagues, including um, Gabriella, who's our comms officer, and um, Ife, Nicolo, and Adriana from our youth team. So each fact sheet basically will focus on a thematic topic of GCA's annual headlight report called State and Trends in Adaptation, uh, which you've heard of briefly earlier um, with thematic topics, including finance, agriculture, water, and of course, gender. And our aim is really to disseminate key information in those chapters in a simple way through the fact sheet and tailored for youth audience, including highlighting case studies from um, our amazing Youth Adapt Challenge in collaboration with African Development Bank and Climate Investment Funds, um, but also trainees from Ban Ki-moon Center, Young Women Leadership on Climate Adaptation Program that Baliki has mentioned. Um, so going back on this um, to this gender fact sheet specifically, next slide, please. Um, so in the next slide, you'll see, yes, a summary of this fact sheet and the full fact sheet will be made available online soon as well. Um, so just to walk folks through a few key messages, I think it's really important to remind ourselves and, um, and others that climate crisis that we're facing is not gender neutral, and especially that women experience more exposure to climate impacts, um, largely because um, the climate change debates have been shaped by stereotypical masculine um, discourses that work to exclude or alienate women and their rights, and most countries do not have gender responsive climate policies. Um, and of course, women are unfortunately cur currently underrepresented in many national and related UN processes. Um, and just to highlight a few points from the fact sheet that there are concerns and challenges faced by women and especially young women, um, including land, land ownership, rights to education, social inequalities, um, and digital divide and the digital gap, which actually is also a focus at CSW this week. Um, of course, there are many other challenges like um, the lack of awareness of structural gender inequalities. So to help empower women, especially young women, um, the report, State and Trends report, also highlighted five key messages, um, including having women represented in decision-making at all levels, and also promote their access to knowledge, more funding at grassroots level, especially to empower them, and develop tools and indicators around gender, and of course, um, have focus on gender desegregated data, 
And last but not the least, governments really need to act urgently together with all the other stakeholders to further support capacity building for young women. And just to end this, we have an amazing case studies highlighted here. Um, from Mironji, who is a trainee of the Ban Ki-moon Center program mentioned before, and she's from DRC, working with local communities on the ground to tackle soil de degradation caused by extensive mining and also to, through that, improve water efficiency through training 50 amazing young women that, who are smallhold farmers and also improving food security through climate smart agricultural practices. Um, also, at the same time, with so many cool benefits, including creating green jobs, improving adaptation, resilience, besides building capacity, and also economically empower women at the local level. So thanks again, everyone. And um, you're welcome to leave any feedback or recommendations about the fact sheet series in the chat uh, or reach out to us through other channels. And please stay tuned to GCA's news around youth empowerment and jobs, and also, of course, our upcoming fact sheets um, of other thematic topics and um, help disseminate them if you wish. And I believe my colleagues can also share the joining link of the Youth Adaptation Network in the chat. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks a lot, Cathy. And as uh, Cathy mentioned, uh, it is the first fact sheet is a draft, and we will also be glad if you can share uh, your feedback about the fact sheet, and we will have one at least uh, monthly. Then uh, today that we are celebrating the International Women's Day, we would like to also conclude this online event uh, with a key point, and um, it has been highlighted the importance to mainstream gender in the climate change agenda, but as well as part of the adaptation effort. Then I am delighted to welcome my colleague, Grace Munga. She's a gender specialist. And uh, Grace, you have been with us during this um, celebration of the International Women's Day, showcasing uh, young women leadership, but also reflections from experts and some of the key findings in uh, reports. What will be your recommendations for mainstreaming gender in the adaptation agenda? Over to you, Grace. Thank you, Adriana, and happy International Women's Day to the women here, the, those that are behind the scenes. Um, yeah, so I'd like to give my recommendations, but I want to give a caveat that this is not an exhaustive list, but from the conversation that we've had, I'd like to summarize it in three high level points. Um, so the first one, and I mean, it has been very clear that, you know, gender has to be integrated in our climate adaptation programs. And most of the times we ask ourselves, how do we do that, right? You know, everyone says integrate gender, but then how do we do that? And under that particular point, I want to emphasize the importance of just um, getting to understand your context, either through gender analysis, either through vulnerability assessments, or any kind of assessment that helps you to understand the context and the gender dynamics, and using this information to then shape your project design, um, to shape the policy recommendations, to shape the data that we're even generating and even to shape the monitoring and evaluation frameworks. So that is the critical part. But the second to that is selecting strategies that are actually transformational. So strategies that not only address practical needs or immediate needs of the women and the men that we are working with, but also strategies that address the long-term needs, the strategic needs, the underlying needs that most of the time it's very hard for us to address, but very fundamental if addressed. Um, and one strategy that I want to highlight here that is not um, well popularized is the importance of engaging men and boys in conversations that also affect women. Um, I know most of the time we've always focused on, you know, advocating for the changes that we uh, are trying to embrace as women, but also men are allies in this agenda. Um, simply because I'd like to reflect and say that gender is not about um, just addressing women needs, but also changing the inequalities that affect both of us, affecting men, affecting women, and all the diverse groups that are out there. And then the second um, point that I want to highlight is the funding. And I think this has been mentioned by different speakers, and even in the challenges that we were discussing in the breakout rooms, 
it was a key concern, you know, that funding um, needs to be increased to be able to uh, make it more accessible to the young women, to the men, um, even to the grassroots levels for them to be able to scale out or scale up their adaptation solutions. And over time as, and through experience, I have seen that in as much as women are being affected by the challenges um, re resulting from climate change, they too also have key solutions that would be helpful for us to scale out locally and even to create an impact that we need. But how do we do that? We need funding, right? So this is a call to action to all the people that are holding the money to just you know, enrich these spaces with financial tools so that we can be able to ensure that the impact is felt wide, wide. And then the last but not the least is to leverage on such forums where we have women engaging, you know, meaningfully participating and sharing their concerns and having the relevant stakeholders in the room so that even as we engage, the stakeholders are able to take up some of these solutions and actually turn them into useful products so that we can feel the impact of the work that we're doing. And I want to give to end with a remark and say, you know, most of the times we say that we're trying to give women a voice, uh, but I want to say that women already have a voice. They just need a microphone to amplify whatever it is that they're trying uh, 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 to bring forth. So I'll end it there and hand it back to you, Adriana. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Grace. And thanks for these recommendations about how we can mainstream uh, gender in the adaptation, uh, how we can in mainstream gender in the adaptation agenda. Then today has been a very rich day. Uh, we are celebrating the International Women's Day and we end with a call to action, a call to action for gender empowerment, for quality education, for finance, and, uh, and also an invitation for all of you to join the Youth Adaptation Network. Um, you can uh, access the link that it has been shared in the chat, and also to mention that as part of the Youth Leadership and Education um, Agenda, we will have several activities. We will start with the series of uh, regional youth adaptation forums. We will start on the 22nd of March with the first forum for the Pacific on the occasion of the uh, water conference and we will continue with uh, every month one youth forum. There will be also multiple opportunities for young people to engage, uh, learning and uh, training opportunities and um, I want to thank all of you for your participation. You can see here the um, link for the Youth Adaptation Network and I want to invite now all the participants uh, to turn on the camera and now that we are celebrating your leadership, your effort uh, to take a family photo uh, that will be shared also uh, in social media and it's a, a, an also a recognition for young women and women that in all over the world are working despite the challenges and making uh, in many opportunities the impossible possible then to continue uh, working to establish uh, networks to uh, also uh, spread the word and uh, continue working with your communities and your families. Then uh, there are still some uh, persons that have not. I invite you to turn on your camera to continue engage with the activities of the Global Center on Adaptation. And uh, yes, now I can see that we have more uh, people from all over the world that have joined this event. Thanks a lot, also special thanks to, to the team that has put together this um, first learning laboratory, to the communication uh, team, to Celine and Juline, and to my team, to Nicolo and Eva for putting together. And a special thanks to all our speakers. Really, you have shared your experience, the highlights and recommendations, and we look forward to continue working with all of you. Then, uh, Eva, please guide us with the photo. Three, two, one. Thank you, everybody. Then thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day and continue celebrating uh, the International Women's Day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.